Well, it's just practice. Practice, 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 and that will make you a lot better. This class is called Intro to Health Science, and we have a couple different units. The unit that you just saw is our CPR unit, um, and they get Red Cross certified for CPR, AED, for adult and pediatric. But the other units, we learn about the history of healthcare. Um, we learn about uh, medical terminology. We learn about some body systems. Uh, it's a really unique class. We have been lo learning about how to care for um, people who aren't responsive in getting them CPR, both uh, small children and adults. Um, we <laughs> also are learning how to um, help choking victims and people who are bleeding with life-threatening life bleeding. Uh, why I want to take this class is uh... One, for the credits, two, because I'm trying to go into a health-related field, so this will help along the way, and three, be CPR certified so I can help anyone out whenever it's needed. I eventually want to go to, into a health career, which I feel like that would be beneficial. It's a good head, like good start to it, so you don't have to like do it while you're learning a million other things. We desperately need middle uh, eight level healthcare providers in town. We need CNAs, we need MAs, we need all sorts of mid-level positions. And so if they get into this class or medical terminology, they can work with the Career Academy or just LPS in general, and then they will help pay for them to go into those careers. So those are entry-level jobs into healthcare that could propel them up to higher careers if they wanted to go farther. Yeah. Um, I'm most excited about that. I can help anyone at any time. So if there's any medical emergency, say out in public, we can be there on time and to help that person out before uh, EMS can get there. Actually, I did teach one student who did use CPR uh, on an instance at, at a swimming pool. Uh, I heard back from that student. Um, and then I've also heard back about how this has helped them get into college. It's good on resumes um, to get into to different activities. Um, I think it's important, so we already have the background knowledge to help someone out if they're having a life emergency and they need help, and because then we can keep on uh, using it throughout our lives. Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Lincoln Public Schools Board of Education for Tuesday, May 9th, 2023. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer. Here. Mr. Boswell. Present. Mrs. Danning. Here. Mrs. Duncan. Here. Mr. Mayhew. Present. Ms. Mungard. Here. Dr. Renner. Here. I would note that we have the meeting, uh, Open Meeting Act posted at the back of the room. And the next item on our agenda this evening is the annual public hearing on the Lincoln Public Schools Student Fees Policy 5520. Before we begin the hearing, I would like to note that staff has recommended no changes to Appendix 1 of the current policy, which can be found as an attachment to Agenda Item 10.1.1 for this meeting for anyone who wishes to review or comment on them. And I would like to first ask staff to give a brief report on the amount of money collected and the use of waivers uh, for the private year, or prior year, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayhew. The Nebraska Public Elementary and Secondary Fee Authorization Act requires us to provide fee waivers for students who qualify for free or reduced lunch. Fee waivers provide qualifying students the right to participate and not pay certain fees uh, provided with special materials or equipment to participate in certain activities. LPS student fee procedures are outlined in Policy 5520 and specifically in Appendix 1, which outlines required fees or materials for which a parent can apply for a fee waiver. During the 21-22 school year, the district provided over $157,000 in fee waivers. For perspective, the six-year average on fee waivers is over $161,000 annually. Nearly 90% of fee waivers go to high school students, with the largest categories being athletics, music, and cheerleading. As Mr. Mayhew mentioned, this year staff recommend no changes to Appendix 1, which outlines the items that are eligible for fee waiver. That completes the report. For those interested in speaking during this public hearing, the same guidelines apply as to public comment. Speakers should complete the blue contact card and present it to staff prior to speaking. Speaker, speakers have a maximum of five minutes to speak. The board does not engage in conversation with the speakers, but listens carefully to the comments as part of its collection of information for consideration of agenda items. 
With that, I hereby open this public hearing before the Board of Education of Lincoln Public Schools. This hearing is be con being conducted under the provisions of the Nebraska Public Elementary and Secondary Student Fee Authorization Act and other Nebraska laws. The purpose of this hearing is to receive input regarding proposed policy 5520 and Appendix 1. The input received in this hearing will be taken into consideration by the board when we take action on proposed policy 5520 and Appendix 1. Uh, so far, I have received no blue cards from anyone wishing to uh, deliver comments for this hearing. Have any other blue cards come in? Seeing none, I hereby close this public hearing. This concludes this <coughs> evening's public hearing on the Lincoln Public Schools Student Fees Policy 5520 and Appendix 1. That brings us next to the approval of minutes. We have one set uh, for your approval. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, those will stand as approved. Uh, we have no special reports, presentations, and celebrations of success tonight, and that takes us right into public comment. Uh, as uh, our, the, the folks who have been here before know, uh, as, soon as, you, as soon as I recognize you, you can come up. You will have three minutes to tell us whatever you would like us to know. I will start the timer uh, as soon as you start your comments. Uh, and to get things started off, I would like to welcome up Jack Anderson. Outside of the classrooms of my speech and debate teachers' rooms, there is a poster. This poster has 12 faces on it, and these faces are of very influential people, ranging from actors to politicians. Every day I walk past that classroom and ask myself, when are LPS students going to be on that poster? That was two years ago. Today I walk past that classroom and wonder if LPS students are going to see their faces on that poster. Today, many members and alumni of the Lincoln Public Schools speech and debate programs are here to ask you one thing, to change the policy made in 2021, then reverse the decision to allow us to go to national tournaments with district sponsorships. Two years ago, in 2021, the school board made a decision regarding regulation 6525.1 in the LEA regulations and policies. This regulation specifically states that all activities after the NSAA speech and debate tournaments are no longer district sponsored. Moreover, these activities do not receive any help from the district and these activities do not receive any help in fundraising from the district. This is not something that I can stand for because this has affected many speech and debate students throughout our city. And I would like to clarify why. It is true that certain schools, such as Southwest and Southeast, do not have to worry as much about this regulation. That's because we have programs that last decades with alumni who have the ability to pay and help us pay for our programs. However, our schools are lucky. We have 21 years at Lincoln Southwest, <coughs> and moreover, we have more alumni than I can even count. However, just because we have the ability doesn't mean everybody does. And because of that, it becomes imperative that you today change the policy. There are students who are going to speak to you today who have to consider foregoing a national tournament because they cannot afford it. There are some coaches who will speak to you today who have had students do the very same. Everybody who speaks to you today will have one request of you. Reverse the policy decision made in 2021. Reinstate national tournaments under non-routine school field trips under policy 6525.1. This policy will not only make it possible for speech and debate students across the city to go to national tournaments, but to change the world. When a football student wants to receive a scholarship, a recruiter comes to the football student. When a speech and debate student wants to receive a scholarship, they have to go to a <coughs> national tournament. And that's exactly the issue we are seeing. This year, the school board affirms that all means all. Right now, I do not see that. I see that all means none, or in the worst case circumstance, all means those who can afford it. Today, I ask you to reverse your policy decision and make it possible for our speech and debate students and every activity student to go to national tournaments and show what Lincoln is made of. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Cameron Cohen. Hello.
Hello, board members. My name is Cameron Cohn, and I'm currently a senior at Southwest High School. I'd also like to express my support for a reversal of policy 6525.1 in order to redesignate national strips from non-routine to non-school or to non-school sponsored. Or to, from non-school sponsored to non-routine. My apologies. I've been on the debate team for all four years of my high school career, and this year I've been lucky enough to qualify to attend nationals in Phoenix and become state champion in public forum debate. Debate has transformed me in ways I didn't even think was possible as an incoming freshman. I used to fear talking in front of my classmates. However, I realized if I wanted to make a meaningful difference someday, I would need to be able to talk in front of my peers confidently. So when one of my friends mentioned that they were planning to join, join the debate team, I jumped to the suggestion. After months of preparation and personal pep talks, I entered my first debate round ever. Despite initially tripping up, I soon found a rhythm I was comfortable with. I discovered that in debate, we are able to talk about something that we care about with people we care about, which makes speaking much easier. After countless Sunday, Saturdays spent at local high schools, hour-long bus rides with our teammates, last-minute rehearsals of speeches, and frantic research of new defenses, I've realized the value that debate has added to not only my lives, but the lives of others as well. Importantly, attending nationals is one of the biggest achievements a debater can attain, showing that their months and often years of hard work have paid off. Moreover, it is a great way to recognize the work done by debaters which will benefit them in the future. Attending nationals can also be a good way to demonstrate one's ability to be successful in college and beyond. This is why I, along with others, would like to speak about reversing the policy change regarding nationals trips made in 2021. I agree with the points they have brought up and would like to voice, to voice my support for redesignating nationals trips. This policy could reversal could help our speech and debate team and many others in a myriad of ways. Specifically, switching this policy would allow the speech and debate team not only access to possible funding for national trips, but for simple access to LPS facilities so students can initiate fundraising opportunities. A quintessential part of debate has been participation in fundraising opportunities in order to aid the team in its ability to be successful throughout the season. Over the years, our team has held bake sales, garage sales, and other fundraising uh, activities using our school to help raise money so we are able to attend tournaments throughout the year. Extending this ability to help raise money for nationals would allow us to ease the financial burden placed on coaches and students alike in order to take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to expand speaking skills, develop lifelong friendships and connections, and expand our worldview. I hope you will consider making a reversal to the changes implemented on policy 6525.1 and redesignate national trips to once again be non-routine instead of non-school sponsored in order to continue to support current and future speakers and debaters in LPS. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up uh, David Samoylenko. Was I close? Uh, good evening, school board. I'm happy to speak and grateful for the opportunity to present in front of the school board today. And I'm here to also support the policies that's been discussed in previous two speeches. I'm here to say that the funding for national speech and debate competition is essential to secure all students' well-being, provide a safe environment for an anyone, and promote equality among young adults. Ability to express yourself is a human need. Speech and debate tournaments provide a safe environment for the students to express themselves. Being able to speak on national level allows students to raise awareness of problems that young people may be struggling with every day. Apart from that, speech and debate is a place where everyone could be anyone. Speech and debate includes at least the same percent of people that require special accommodations, if not more, because unlike many of the athletic activities, speech and debate does not have a, any particular requirements for the students. Furthermore, LPS students don't only include everyone, but also constantly prove and promote their beliefs on national levels. The example of Ellie Weeks, who spoke up and managed to persuade the National Board of Speech and Debate to change their policy to a more equal and acceptable environment for every student. We can see how LPS <coughs> students speak up on national levels to also promote the policies that school board supports, such as the all means all program. I'm a Ukrainian national, and even though I haven't been to an LPS for long, for just a year, I feel dear about the cause. I myself am going to the national tournament and have been struggling with the fee for it. I'm bringing my speech about the horrors and life of people who have been affected by wars all around the world. Being able to speak up is what we need so much these days. Therefore, I kindly ask the school board to consider helping its students to not only express themselves, but also bring a change to their community, country, and the world. 
I thank you, I thank the school board for their attention. Thank you. Next, I would like to call up Noah Hoover. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I'm here before you today to ask for a reconsideration on the travel and funding restrictions for speech and debate. When I first joined LPS in middle school, after a few years of being homeschooled, I decided I'd try my hand at debate. It's something that stuck with me from the beginning. As I've carried my participation all throughout most of my time in high school, I, along with many other debaters, discovered the, ma the major role that speech and debate play in our growth as students, citizens, and peers. The most important concept here is opportunity. Specifically, we're asking for the opportunity to compete, learn, research, and continue practicing our skills that we gain from speech and debate. As growing students in the future generation, it's important that we be able to have these opportunities. The National Debate Tournament is particularly significant, and the ability to compete there is most important. Specifically, because it is the premier event for high school, uh, for high school speech and debate, throughout the process of nationals, we students expand our abilities to communicate, analyze complex real world issues, and think critically about many different perspectives on current events and topics. These skills we learn are essential for success in today's world. <clears throat> By providing these chances to us, you empower the future leaders, business owners, politicians, teachers, and more to make a positive impact in their communities and the world. These skills and experiences extend way past just a tournament in June. These skills are one we take with us throughout the rest of our academic career, and the experiences we make with the other people we get to travel with, compete against, and meet from all over the nation are experiences we will never forget, but will remember for years, even after high school and college. When we're able to travel more, it provides extremely important opportunities to be a part of communities. For example, in my past years, I've connected with people from the coasts, Texas, Minnesota, and nearly every other state. Through these networks, I've <clears throat> been granted opportunities to learn, teach, and spread information on important social issues that affect my life and future. Um, <clears throat> lastly, it's important, to note that that the, it's important to note the success of speech and debate programs within LPS from years. Uh, we did have more funding. Schools from within Lincoln have proven to have, very to, ver to have very highly qualified debaters from multiple schools who received invitations sorry, to the most prestigious tournaments like the Tournament of Champions or qualified for this upcoming national tournament. This does not only represent Lincoln, but the state of Nebraska as a whole. For example, Lincoln East High School has the second most entries in the entirety of the national tournament, which means we have a unique opportunity to bring, tro to bring back trophies as well as proof that Lincoln has a strong, successful, and equitable speech and debate program. While we have many, while we have many people qualified, funding is still the number one issue for making sure we don't lose numbers at the tournament. <clears throat> while speech and debate continue to grow over the years, funding and opportunities are critical to keep it alive. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to call up Julie, Julia Zeleny, and Sarah Kai is on deck. Hello, my name is Julia Zeleny, and I'm currently a freshman at UNL and an alum of Lincoln East High School. I was also a member of the debate team for my junior and senior years of high school, and I'm here to advocate for the various debate teams in the district which have had a significant financial barrier to attending nationals placed upon them. And while anyone can tell you the educational benefits of debate and how attending nationals opens doors to scholarships and opportunities for students, I want to offer my opinion as an individual on how debate has helped me. One of the goals of the Lincoln Board of Education is to develop responsible adults, quote, who are productive citizens of the pluralistic community, nation, and world, end quote. Nothing has developed me as a citizen as much as debate. I think that while previous generations have struggled with apathy towards politics and civic issues, my generation struggles with hopelessness. In the past few years, I have watched as people have been stripped of their rights, mass shootings have occurred at increasing rates, the planet has suffered at the hands of humanity, and polarization has torn our country apart. I have woken up, read the news, and just sobbed because I have felt so powerless to do anything about it. A big part of this feeling comes from the opposition and anger within our society. We have forgotten how to compromise and how to understand each other. And when our political space has two main teams, both of which regularly resort to undignified and petty attacks on one another, it kills my desire to even try to participate. How can I reason with the professional adults who act like the seven-year-olds I counsel at summer camp when they don't get their way? 
The debate space is full of unique, interesting ideas driven by complex decision making that take economics, philosophy, and politics into their calculus. It helped me understand that there are ways to think outside of the binaries of left or right, and it gives me hope that one day others will see the gray areas too. Debate does not tell me how to think. It gives me the resources to decide for myself. It also gives me the respect for my opponents and where they stand. I can hear them out, understand their position, and still compliment and make friendly conversation with them after the round. Nationals will allow students to explore even more nuanced perspectives. The opportunity to connect with other students will allow them to grow not just as debaters, but as people and citizens. I truly believe exposure to new thoughts and people is the way we can combat polarization, apathy, and hopelessness in the next generation and create a more positive political space, one that invites and unifies instead of divides and disappoints. By choosing to limit the ability of students to attend nationals, you are failing at your own aforementioned goal of creating competent citizens. And I urge you to reconsider as both a debater and someone who wants to hope for a better future. And I'd also like to make a personal appeal. As a judge, I have seen the students in the last year take risk, and they have blown me away with how much they have grown and improved as both people and debaters. And adding such a huge barrier to their attendance to nationals would be an injustice for all of the time and energy they have put into the activity. Thank you, and I urge you to reconsider. Thank you. I'd like to call up Sarah Kai, and John Holman is on deck. Good evening, distinguished board members. My name is Sarah Kai, and I'm here today with fellow members of the speech and debate programs of the Lincoln Public School District to talk about reinstating district support for the National Speech and Debate Tournament and out-of-state travel. Debate has changed my life. Every single day, I feel incredibly blessed to be a part of such an amazing community supported by our phenomenal teachers, schools, and district. The Nebraska speech and debate community has given me a voice not often heard in other activities, and I sincerely cannot imagine what my life would have been like without it. Because of this, I aspire through everything I do to give future Lincoln students a chance to benefit from this life-changing activity as well. First and foremost, competitive debating instills vital skills which are essential for success in various aspects of life. Debaters learn to think critically, communicate effectively, and analyze complex issues, equipping us to become strong leaders and active participants in society. The advocacy and communication skills I have gained through debate have encouraged me to participate more actively in the community and work towards change surrounding issues I personally believe in. Additionally, the opportunity to engage with some of the brightest young minds from across the country at national tournaments fosters healthy intellectual competition and cultural exchange, as well as exposing students to similarly motivated peers from around the nation. Ideas and perspectives from numerous standpoints all come to a crossroads in speech and debate, and the unique benefit of large national scale tournaments will broaden horizons, nurture tolerance, and encourage um, diversity and inclusivity while discussing important issues which some of the most intelligent and qualified students from across the nation to make a difference. Furthermore, as only one of four schools who competed in policy debate at the 2023 Nebraska State Debate Tournament, being limited to it exclusively debating in Nebraska severely restricts our opportunities to compete and thus improve. While other extracurricular activities often have robust competition in Lincoln and within the state, Policy debate is a small yet competitive community which mainly exists on the national level. Competing nationally against some of the best teams in the country on the national level has been imperative to the growth of our debating skills. However, this was only made possible through the prevalence of online debate as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And as life returns back to normal, we will lose access to many of these tournaments and the benefits which come with them. Likewise, the National Speech and Debate Tournament is an essential part of the year which the entire season builds up to. It's a big motivator for the work we do during the season as we prepare the entire year, practicing our skills, doing research, preparing for qualifiers, and finally the opportunity to travel to Arizona this June for the National Tournament. To make our participation in the National Speech and Debate Tournament possible, we are seeking financial support from the school board. Thank you for your time and um, commitment to this matter. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up John Holen and Jeremy Mausoli is on deck. Good evening, board members, and thank you for your time. 
Uh, my name is John Holland, and I'm currently the head debate coach at Lincoln East High School, where I've also been a teacher now for nine years. And prior to that, I worked at Lincoln High School. Uh, so I've spent about 11 out of my 14 years of adult life working in the district and coaching debate here. I wanted to speak tonight because there's nothing that's been had more of an impact on my life than speech and debate. Uh, because of this, I want to ensure that students have the, the, are able to continue to have the opportunities that I was able to have and that I've seen other students have. I went to high school in central Nebraska. Over four years, the speech and debate team became my home. Not my home away from home, but my home. It was the place where I felt the most safe, the place where I could be myself. It exposed me to new ideas and new people, which expanded my horizons and taught me more than any class. This is a testament to the immensely educational experience that speech and debate offers. Uh, they, because of this, I was able to learn how to research efficiently, how to think critically, and write effectively. I discovered my voice, and I discovered how to speak my truth. I had the opportunity to attend nationals when I was in high school, which was an amazing opportunity. And because of that, I was able to get a scholarship to debate at UNL, where I got to further travel around the country and experience uh, more than I could have ever imagined growing up in a small farming community. But it's because of this I decided to become a debate coach after graduating college. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, East has one of the more, let's say, homogenous student body demographics. Despite this, for the last decade, the debate team has been a bastion of diversity. This year, for example, we have more than 10 nationalities represented on our team. We have students with disabilities, students from a wide array of economic backgrounds, and many students who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. There are conservatives, there are progressives, there are Christians, Hindus, and Muslims on our team. And this diversity is not just on paper. It is a real and lived part of the team experience. Walk into practice any day of the week, and I invite you to do that. And you will witness students sharing their different experiences that are tied, for, or their perspectives tied to their experiences. They learn to engage and value different perspectives in order to support each other as teammates and to find a way to work together. In other words, exactly the kind of diversity and inclusion that this district seeks to foster. Furthermore, it gives them opportunities after high school. On my team, 100% of the students I have coached have gone on to higher education after graduating. The vast majority have gone to their first school, and at least two per year have gone to Ivy League or similarly prestigious schools. Many have gone there on needs-based scholarships. None of this is to brag, mind you, because my team is not unique. Walk into any thriving debate team in this district and you will find something similar. A welcome home, home where people of all backgrounds belong and learn to speak their truth while learning skills to have a successful future. And as you've heard tonight, the national tournament is an important piece of that experience. So I urge you to reconsider this policy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jeremy, come on up and help me with uh, pronouncing your name. Uh, Say again? Masoli. Masoli, thank you. Come on up. And Allison Durr is on deck. I came here today because I believe that LPS should be providing funding for speech and debate kids to go to national tournaments. I've already seen so many of my friends and peers unable to participate in nationals due to funding, and I think that nationals is an event that is very good in terms of education, since we get to go up against other high-level speech and debate kids from other states and learn new arguments, form new friendships, and take in new perspectives, which is all about what, all what debate is about. And by not providing funding for nationals, it only sets us as a community back because now we can't take these learning experiences back, back to Lincoln and better contribute to our society. It also lowers the amount of investment that we're putting into our own futures. Funding for Nats is important not just in that sense, but also in that it makes speech and debate an exclusive place that is only accessible for those that live in higher income households that can afford to fund the cost to go to Nats. Speech and debate is meant to be a space where kids of all backgrounds can come together and learn things that will greatly benefit their lives and the lives of others. We're all just kids that want to go out and learn, compete, and represent our city. And if LPS would provide funding for nationals, we would be able to do this on a much greater scale. We've all worked very hard all year, and many of us have been working towards this specific event all year, and for it to be squashed just because of funding issues is quite heartbreaking. We as a community would be very thankful if you considered uh, funding nationals for all LPS students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Allison Durr and Tracy O'Brien is on deck. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Allison Durr. I am an alumnus of an LPS high school speech team. I'm also a lawyer and on the board of directors of a nonprofit formed solely to help an LPS high school afford to go to nationals each year as a direct result of LPS's current policy and the barriers that created. It's important for you all to first understand that national tournaments are not just extras or special optional postseason tournaments that would be nice for students to attend. National tournaments are the tournaments that students work to qualify for throughout the season. These are the grand finales of a forensic season. Qualifying to attend and represent Nebraska at these tournaments is an incredible and penultimate achievement that takes a lot of work, talent, and victories, and it's normally really great news for a student. But under your current policy, qualifying is now just the first step for an LPS student to actually follow through on that achievement. Because LPS does not fund nationals to actually attend, an LPS student has to have the luck of being able to afford that tournament themselves or attend a school lucky enough to have alumni who are organized, willing, and wealthy enough to pay for these students to attend each year and a coach willing to put in their own money and risk to accompany you because district does not fund insurance for these trips. And even if your team and alumni are willing to fundraise for you, the barriers within LPS's current rules, including that you cannot fundraise on school grounds, time, or association, make it very hard to do so effectively. More importantly, the inequities this policy creates are unacceptable. National tournaments are important but expensive per person. We know that almost 40 or over 40% of LPS high school students participate in free and reduced lunch, meaning almost half of these students are around the federal poverty line and are very unlikely to be able to afford national tournaments themselves. So those students are forced to hope that their alumni are wealthy enough to pay the thousands of dollars to support them to attend nationals each year. And of course, LPS low-income families disproportionately include families of color, meaning schools with higher percentages of low-income families of color are less likely to actually be able to attend national tournaments, meaning the students who actually get to go represent Nebraska at these tournaments are more likely to be wealthy, white, and not from LPS. LPS should want to encourage their students to represent it fully and successfully in such a well-respected high school activity that consistently produces such high achieving alumni. This policy discourages that and decreases diversity against LPS's commitment to equity, inclusion, and success for students. The skills and achievements I gained through high school speech have been invaluable to my life and career and led me directly to becoming a lawyer as well as many other uh, forensics alumni. So I urge you to please reconsider this policy and help support students. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next is Tracen O'Brien, come on down. I graduated from East High in 2021, and Lincoln Speech and Debate has been very important to me be, like, being a better part of my community and to improve my ability in life to think through and make well rationed out decisions and well researched decisions. I believe that if you wanted to, if you wanted to cripple a community's ability to make citizens that are able to make well thought out and well rationed decisions and to vote and follow through in the political sphere accordingly, the first step would be to cut funding to Lincoln Speech and Debate because that is the foundation for which many of our citizens are able to gain the skills and abilities necessary to Apologies. The skills and abilities necessary to follow th through with that. Lincoln speech and debate, and Lincoln in particular, is named out after Abraham Lincoln, which is some of the most important speeches and debates in our nation have come from the Lincoln-Douglas speech and debates. And that is why, in particular, I think that it is a disgrace that Lincoln, LPS, has cut funding to na nationals for a city named af after the president that has sponsored some of the most important debates in our, our history as a nation. 
Thank you for your time. I do please wish to reiterate that we ought to be fu funding Lincoln speech and debate. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My dear board colleagues and Superintendent Gosman, as we know, it's not our normal practice to respond to public comments, uh, but I would like to take a quick moment and reflect on our students uh, taking the time to come and bring their concerns to us and to deliver uh, these cogent arguments. Uh, I know that you are here asking a question. Uh, I think we might be dealing with a little bit of a, of a misunderstanding. I'm not aware that the board has made uh, changes to Regulation 6525.1. We'll take a look at it. We will review it. Uh, but I did want to take a moment to say thank you all uh, for coming down, and, uh, and we're proud of you. Good job. Might I add to that? Please. If, if I might, and, and I, I also uh, want to acknowledge that if, if we're going to frustrate a group of students uh, who might come and speak at a board meeting, it ought not be this group, uh, <laughs> because they are, 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 obviously our coaches are doing their jobs. Uh, we value everything that you say. Um, we value the work that you do. Uh, and I want to thank the students and former students who have addressed us tonight. And I know it's not easy to do that. Um, and you are appropriately passionate about the way in which this world can be better because of your participation in this worthwhile activity. I do want to clear up just a piece of confusion based on some of what I heard this evening. And I know Dr. Neal um, will meet with uh, this group again to clear up any confusion. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I just want to make certain that, that we understand the, the, the you, you, several people have indicated that the, the board at one time funded this and then that has changed and that the policy decisions uh, were made and that changed the policy. Uh, the board did not make a change in Regulation 6525.1. We have never in our history covered the costs of students to attend national speech. I'm, I'm not against having a conversation about doing so, but that's a budget request. We have to consider what we don't do in order to be able to do that. But, um, and I, I believe that's been um, uh, inaccurately surmised here this evening is that at one time we covered the cost for students to go to a national level, and that's not the case. Uh, the extra standard committee made a difficult decision to cut funding that covered staff member costs making the trip uh, because of budgets, and that made a trip to nationals a non-school sponsored status because the staff weren't covered, which is mentioned in that policy 6525.1. That kind of source of the problem, I think, is where this lies. And I will touch base with, with Jack afterward, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, Dr. Neal will work with this. I, I also want to be clear that, that we have uh, a school district foundation. Uh, for this very sort of thing where we, we know that tax dollars can only go so far and we thank our taxpayers for everything they do invest and we want to return that investment to the taxpayers with high quality programs but we can look for other ways to try and support and assist with funding as well. Again, I want to state that LPS has never covered the cost uh, for students to go to the national levels and that's not just in this activity, that's in other activities, all other activities. The only cost previously covered was for a coach uh, but those are the conversations I think we'll need to have in the future and I'll do all that I can uh, because I value this activity so greatly thank you thanks Paul <clears throat> uh, getting back to the remainder of our public comments I would like to call up Malmoon Qureshi good afternoon my name is Malmoon Qureshi and I'm a student at Maryland Moore Middle School what I'm here to say today is the feel of the curriculum we have right now in the district. To begin, I disagree with the curriculum that's being taught currently across the board. The way it's constructed just isn't flexible for the student. The environment that we have right now with this curriculum and what we're being taught hasn't reflected on what the student's opinion is, and that student has, is just so stressed out from it. I'm going to bring up an example with myself. I've gone through everything I could in my school alone to try to fix an issue that's been arise. I've tried getting the amount of flexibility I can. I've been enrolled in numerous district programs, including the 504 one, 502, my mistake if I got it wrong. And I can say the same for other students. But it's all come down to one th issue. I've been told each time that it all comes down to the board. and. Having that curriculum continue to transition into high school also, from what I was told, 
it's just going to continue to make an impactful environment on what we have in our district. It's going to continue to affect students. Sure, on paper, once in a while, you'll see, oh, test scores, let's say, they look great and all, but truly inside on the student, they feel stressed out. They continue to have negative opinions on the teacher, the what's being taught to them. They're going to continue being continue having this mindset on them. And I'd also like to bring up another issue is I mentioned the environment. Across numerous schools, the environment, physical and mentally, just is so draining. The way that the environment is organized, and bring up the physical part, such as the interior design. Minor stuff such as vegetation, like small pots, or allowing students doing nice weather to go outside on a regular is giving the student the flexibility to, let's, re let's say, reading in English class. They're going to feel comfortable with their flexible environment. But having an entire program dedicated for that to just, let's say, go down to the library, at least in my opinion, and numerous others, is a little overwhelming and over the top. Allowing stuff such as going outside on the regular as an already pre-planned thing that isn't extensive is going to help the student a lot, and I mean a lot. You're giving that student the flexibility they need, and they're going to feel comfortable doing their assignments. The same can apply to numerous other topics such as music. And my argument I just made, I would say the same for any of the other ones. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to call up Ali Whaley. Wally, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, distinguished board. Uh, I come to you today as a member of the community. I just want to thank you all for all the work that you guys are doing because I know that it's hard and I know you guys aren't getting paid for it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, next, I would like to call up Gary Nelson. Evening, I'm Gary Nelson, and uh, congratulations to the new and the uh, re-elected board members. I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, thanks, Matt, uh, very much. Uh, Matt and I got together about three weeks ago and discussed and shared and so I have a much better feel of some of the procedures and step forward uh, to work with uh, various uh, issues, uh, thoughts, programs that may come up. Uh, one of the concerns I wanted to express tonight was that of staffing and I know it's a challenge. Uh, I talked to with a young person and they were responsible for finding their own substitute on a more maternity leave situation and so I thought, thought that was uh, quite unusual and I know I haven't taught in Lincoln Public Schools for uh, 20 some years ago but definitely did. Uh, Matt had said that, of course uh, concerns about why people are uh, might be leaving the the district and I know there is retirements but there's the exit uh, strategy uh, exit poll that they take of staff members uh, in my situations, uh, the people that have talked to me when it's a uh, person who's retiring, they're just so happy, and I was too, uh, that they were a uh, little less stress as the young man was talking about. And some young people are looking to go elsewhere, and I think one of the examples of that and why that is, is some of the requirements of the district, and I know there was comments about the uh, flights that were put up in rooms and I was told that that was strictly voluntary but then a principal informed th this staff member that yes it was voluntary but that designated that their room was a safe place so if I am a teacher and I don't volunteer to put up the flag then does that mean my room is unsafe it could be derived, or that chain of thought could uh, be part of that. So this person, anyway, the two teachers under the age of 30, and they're looking at leaving the school district, and that was one of those uh, issues in that. And so uh, another area that uh, I will be looking forward to uh, working on is 
the library materials that were brought up earlier, and I definitely am one of those persons that's concerned about budgets. And I know uh, two years ago the district gave uh, used all of 13 percent, uh, except for one percent they did not uh, use. So 12 percent increase there, and then last year assessed valuations were up nine percent, and the district used all the one percent again, or used eight of it. So. Basically, the districts had a 20% tax, property tax increase, and so that's a concern for me. So thanks very much. Appreciate it. You have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. One thing you'll want to uh, factor in the next time you do those calculations is the corresponding drops in state aid as well. Yep. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Rachel Coleman. She was bullied out of her school. We're not We've not been offered any kind of reasonable accommodations yet. Actually, the exact opposite has happened. <clears throat> and right now, I'd like to read to you a couple of emails that I received from my school principal, where my daughter is still currently enrolled. So this is from May 2nd. Um, she said, I apologize for the delay in re uh, responding to your previous emails. I was busy with other responsibilities at Park. You now have my response to your request. As indicated in that response, there will be no more further communication until your daughter returns to school. If you have additional questions related to policy or legal interpretation, please direct them to the district's legal counsel. That's for my daughter's school. I can't get her makeup work. I've actually had to take her back to my family so she can finish school in Ohio because this school district has told me that they cannot accommodate my child. They cannot make school a safe place for her. But Ohio has said, yes, we can. How is that fair to me as a parent and to her as an 11-year-old having to be separated from her primary caregiver for her whole life to finish school to make sure get, she gets into the seventh grade? That's preposterous to me. The second thing I would like to read to you out loud today is because we were talking about this last time, that my child's civil rights have been violated on multiple occasions. So have mine. Case in point, today I tried to walk into your school board meeting and I was physically stopped by somebody who was running this. And I was asked, is he a service dog? And I said, yes, and that's a legal question. And she said, where's his vest? And I said, I don't legally have to have him have one. And this is what happened in the school four times before anybody did anything. And it's still happening in this building. So I can clearly see that we don't have a whole lot of regards for people's civil rights. <clears throat> as far as um, the, the laws that I had, um, I was mentioning that are being broken here, uh, we have a lot of them and I don't have a whole lot of time. So let me, um, let me go through a couple ones. So Lincoln School Board policy says that the Lincoln Public Schools provides a physically safe and emotionally secure environments for all students and staff inappropriate behavior, including but not limited to bullying, intimidation, and harassment must be avoided by students and all staff. I would say that hasn't happened, and I would say that the staff has participated at this point. Also, case in point, when I let my principal know that I was indeed filing an OCR complaint the same day she came back after 40 missed absences, not 20, that they have not excused, now I've been reported to the county attorney for truancy. Now, that's not okay. And let's read from the ACLU, if, you, if I can have a couple of seconds. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Coleman, that's your time. Okay. Next, I'd like to call up Amanda Ripley. Good evening. Last week, there was an important local election, and three of you were elected by 20,304 voters. But there were also 13,029 voters who voted against you. That means there are at least 13,209 community stakeholders who were able to vote and think that your opponent was more qualified or trustworthy to carry out the duties of an LPS board member. That's a significant number. So we community stakeholders will watch expectantly to see if you faithfully and fairly carry out the assigned board member tasks with integrity that those who voted for you hope that you have. 
and what are those tasks? Well, I definitely won't get through all of them in three minutes, but I'll state some of them. I think it's important that you know what your duties are as well as the public knowing what your duties are. I got this information from the LPS website. In the duties of the LPS board section, it says the board holds the district staff accountable for achieving the district's mission through the most effective and efficient use of available resources. The board further recognizes that students in the Lincoln Public Schools are educated for the future and therefore expects the district to be self-renewing, flexible, and capable of adjusting to the needs of its various constituencies. As the elected governing board of the school district, the board believes in sharing its decision-making processes with parents, students, other citizens, and staff members. Then there's the vision statement. The overarching vision of Lincoln Public Schools is to prepare all students to be college, career, and civic life ready with the goal of 90% on-time graduation. Purpose and role of the board. As an agency of the state, the Lincoln Public Board, the Lincoln Board of Education is the governing body for the Lincoln Public Schools. It has full responsibility for the general control and direction of the school system. These are incredibly weighty responsibilities and I hope you live up to the expectation for all of our students best. Finally, I'm incredibly proud of the three Republican candidates who ran an honest campaign. Unlike Connie Duncan, who campaigned on Piyush's behalf, discrediting Emmy Pollan's qualifications. You visited my parents. Getting 13,000 votes in eight short weeks is quite the accomplishment for the Republican candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to call up Martin Lippart. Okay, so to begin, I thought I would just uh, share with you a little bit uh, what I'm, that I'm reading uh, a lot of books, I'm watching a lot of presentations, interviews uh, on issues pertaining to education. I'm doing that so I can speak to you with authority. So I read The Dying Citizen by Victor Davis Hanson, Economic Facts and Fallacies by Thomas Sowell, uh, Neuroscience of Intelligence by Richard Heyer, The Bell Curve by Ernstine and Murray. And I even read Courageous Conversations about race by Singleton and Linton. So as I read these works, I contemplate on current school affairs. So one thought I had recently is concerning the LPS dress code. Why do we have a dress code? Well, that's easy. We don't want students to display anything that is distracting or indecent, right? So in order to enforce the code, we somehow know without being given too many specifics, what constitutes indecent clothing? Somehow we all have this natural indecency sensor. Beep, 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 beep. Mothers even have it in the back of their head, right? So yet, for some reason, your sensor is not going off when it comes to indecent material at your libraries, which has been shown to you time and again. Using the same rationale that indicate indecent student closing should also indicate indecent books. Please fix your sensor. Now along those same lines, you know when students display something distracting, yet again for the same reason, you cannot see that Black Lives Matter flags or gay pride flags are also distracting. When you reasonably restrict students' First Amendment rights in order to fulfill your teaching mission, it should be very important to you not to give the appearance of a conflict of interest to an outside observer. Apply standards more equitably. equitably. Now, there's a more sinister view of the recent gay pride flag controversy at LPS. I'm not claiming originality of this point. It's simply something I saw during a presentation by James Lindsay at the Woke Conference of the European Parliament. He stated that when an entity conquers the ground of an opponent, it signifies this by putting up its flag. You know, like the famous picture of the six Marines who put up the American flag on Iwo Jima. The presence of the gay pride flag is a symbol of a French activist minority claiming victory over our classroom. That's the view. The only flag in the classroom should be the American flag. It's the one and only flag that truly stands for inclusivity. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I would call up Elena Brulette. Today I'm speaking on behalf of an employee of LPS who wishes to remain anonymous due to fear of backlash from administration. I want to encourage LPS employees to not be afraid to come to board meetings and speak out it is, as it is highly unethical and against the law for your employer to retaliate against you for speaking up about concerns or problems you are facing from them. The concerns are that LPS administration and superiors do not care about the employees below them. There was a $1,000 hiring bonus posted for new hires, but apparently paras were not eligible for this bonus. It was not specified upon hire when it should have been. This was misleading and upsetting to the new para employee who thought she would uh, receive this hire on bonus, so poor communication. Newly hired staff with no previous training will be earning the same wage as people who have already been uh, teaching and working there. Um, and were required to have specific training before being hired. This is demoralizing. And my own addition, administration positions such as the admin for DEI will get paid 100,000 to 140,000 a year to be a white hating racist sack of garbage and promote racism against white children at schools. How valuable. I will continue to speak on behalf of employees anytime they come to me with concerns that need to be addressed I hope the school board takes these concerns seriously since the intent of the school board is to represent the public rather than act as enforcers of someone else's will. I know we have a newly elected member of the board who thinks parents need to stay away from their child's education, but I thought the point of being an elected official was to listen to, um, to his constituents and what they want and not push them away. However, since everyone on the board thinks the same as him, I know Piyush will fit right in. I know teachers like Lindsay Tillingast agree that with that mindset, but anyone who thinks this way has some sort of sick motive behind them to be hiding something from parents and wanting them to stay uninvolved. My guess would be so it's easier for the board to push DEI, CRT, and gender theories that parents don't want their children to be taught. If children were being baptized by teachers behind their parents' backs, I'm sure you would all have entirely different opinions on parental involvement in schools. As for Piyush, he should know that good parents will never be uninvolved in their child's lives or education. Parents are there to protect their children from predators who try and slither behind their back and harm their children physically or mentally. Next, I'd like to call up Tom Hansen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly. I'm just coming here representing myself on behalf of public ed education and the value it has to our community in general. Uh, you can measure a society, its stability, its wealth by the quality of its public education. Um, I did some graduate studies in the University of Stockholm in Sweden, and they're known for having some of the best schools on earth. And they're about the size of greater Chicago area and they have Swedish, there's Volvo and Saab and Astrovinica, Fishkars, you know, you see their products everywhere. This small country produces tremendously and is wealthy because of their focus on education. Um, they start their teachers at about 75K, by the way. Um, another Example is Minnesota is always rated as one of the top education states in the nation, partly because Swedes dominated the politics there. But they have high taxes, they have unions, their climate is not that friendly, they have high wages, but they have more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any state in the union. So all of those other things taxes and so forth, apparently are not as important as the value of education. Mm -hmm. And to bring it to a micro, I've always had such respect for the 30 years I've lived in Lincoln for the quality of Lincoln Public Schools and what they've done and what they do. Um, I work socially, we're working on some mental health things. Um, incidentally, in Sweden, they have a poverty rate of 1%. I think 
Lincoln has a poverty rate of about 12, and that translates into however many in the students, uh, low to moderate income. So the public school system is the recep receptacle of bad public policy. We, you, have to deal with those issues constantly. There's a shortage of mental health providers, there's a shortage of housing in Lincoln. Um, there is much that could be done. Um, I just wanted to give support for that. Also for the speech and debate kids, I, I'm not, I'm really, that's the essence of public education is teaching people to come up and advocate for themselves. Um, and I think that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, last, I would like to call up Gina Frank. Thank you. Uh, I heard the young man talking about more outside time, and I'm fully on board with that. Also, longer lunches. Uh, when I subbed, it was a battle to get all the kids down to the lunchroom, find the teacher's lounge, find my lunch, get it warmed up, and eat it before I had to go and find the kids again, because every school is just a little different, and some of them are mirror image, so um, I remember that being an issue, and I have a second grader who loves to talk, so a longer lunch period would be nice probably for everyone. Um, not sure how that works out logistically. I'm sure that would be a nightmare to implement, but um, you can add it to the tally of, like, things we would love to see. Um, also more outside time. Um, and I, that's, that's like my main complaint. <laughs> more outside time, more, um, more lunch time. Um, I was really impressed by the debate team kids who were here. Um, I would love to donate to a fundraiser for that. So, you know, come, somebody come find me um, before you leave, because uh, I would love to donate to that um, to help fund that, because I know taxpayer dollars don't go that far, um, and we have a lot that we need to do in LPS. Um, and just thank you all for everything that you do. Thank you. All right, that concludes public comment and brings us to the consent agenda. To start things off, are there any statements of conflict? Ms. Mumgarden? Out of an abundance of caution, I hereby declare a potential conflict of interest and hereby abstain from voting on check number 676239 as part of agenda item 9.2.A of the agenda materials for this meeting. I vote in favor of all other consent items. Ms. Meyer? Yes, out of abundance of caution, I hereby declare a potential conflict of interest. Abstain from voting on check number 676246 as part of the agenda item 9.2.A of the agenda materials for this meeting. I vote in favor of all other consent items. And I have one to read. Out of an abundance of caution, I hereby declare a potential conflict of interest and abstain from voting on check number 676244 as part of agenda item 9.2.A of the agenda materials for this meeting. I vote in favor of all other consent items. With those being read, is there a motion for the consent agenda? Mrs. Danik? I would move to approve the consent agenda, noting those conflict of interest. Thank you. Mr. Boswell? Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer. Yes. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Lombard. Yes. Dr. Rauner. Yes. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Uh, next, that brings us to item 10.1.1, .1, uh, the policy 5520 uh, student fees. And we will start with Mr. Boswell. Um, I would note that this is the item that was the subject of our hearing earlier in the meeting. It's been reviewed by the Student Learning Committee. There's no changes from last year, and I would let Matt make any other comments he wants to make. Nothing further to add. Okay. All right, that'll be back. Uh, oh, sorry, Mrs. Danik. So when a student wants to access student fees, I know I heard during the public hearing that they had to make an application or an, an inquiry and they have to fill out paperwork. Can they do this in each of their schools? Yes. And they it's go online. 
and they should go online or can they talk to their principal? They can or? do either one, whatever is convenient for them, but it is essentially done online. It's right on the front page under frequently requested information or whatever that label is. Some parents just forget to look online. And it's also in the important information yeah. handbook that's mailed to everyone as a paper form at the back. Perfect. Thank you for reiterating that. I would also add most of the student fees come from extracurricular activities. Coaches and sponsors are very good at trying to help connect families to available resources, whether it's student fees, foundation, or community resources. So I have one more follow-up. So I heard a lot from debate students today, and they are an NSAA-sanctioned uh, organization within the confines of the state of Nebraska. Is that correct? Do anything, uh, their tournaments held through the NSAA? That is correct. And tournaments outside of the NSAA are not covered, sanctioned by LPS? They have an established season that goes through the year and ends in March. And so <laughs> what they're, when they're talking about nationals, they're all happen in the summer. So those are not part of the covered season for Lincoln Public Schools and NSAA. So would this be akin to what competition music groups do where they fundraise for those outside of their normal classroom activities or their competitions? There's a number of groups. Uh, the students in Lincoln Public Schools just do amazing things and look for opportunities to extend their skills well beyond the school. So that includes cheer, dance, we the people, speech, debate, math counts, a large number of activities to look for things beyond the regular high school season. Thank you. Ms. Byron? Oh, I had some follow-up <clears throat> questions regarding uh, speech and debate in regard to student fees in the waiver system. Um, I just want to clarify, because the regulation, which is established by staff, eliminated the support for the speech and debate coaches to go to national, that that then made going to nationals not school supported, going and eliminating their ability to fundraise on school property. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah. John? So students, what happened was in the extra standard guidelines, which impacts teacher pay, mm -hmm. coaches and sponsored, it was no longer included in what they're paid for. So then if coaches and students want to go, it has to be a non-school sponsored. The, whether they fundraise on or off school grounds, then if it's a non-school sponsored activity, fundraising on school grounds, then they go through the normal facility use for a non-school sponsored activity. And I'll give you an example. Just recently, Kinky Boots used, rented the facility at the auditorium at Southwest High School to raise funds to make a trip to Indianapolis for their, nat I think it's international, competition. And so there are still ways to use facility, use materials, but they just go through a slightly different process when it's a non-school sponsored. And that applies to all those different activities I described. Okay. As well as things like um, close-up trip to Washington, D.C., trips mm -hmm. to Europe for uh, world language. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few student activities that both use the school and use community uh, opportunities to make, uh, do that fundraising. <clears throat> but right now they're experiencing barriers in the, uh, our high schools that um, serve our students that come from low-income families? They're not it, no different than any other activity. So, um, and I think one person, if you're at a particular school, cheer, dance, we the people, um, speech, debate, uh, all of those go through the same process, whichever school they're at. So the mm -hmm. same opportunities for um, school-sponsored, they have one set of, of opportunities, and non-school-sponsored have opportunities as well. But we can admit to the fact that there would be an equity issue between different high schools in the population that they're serving on accessing. And that's why we work. We've had a couple of meetings with the speech and debate coaches and talked about how they could pool their resources to find a community-wide way to raise funds so that it wasn't just one school raising funds and another school raising funds, but schools pooling together. In fact, one school has already established a nonprofit organization to help collect that, and we've encouraged them to all come together as one community group within that nonprofit because it helps all the schools, all the LPS kids work together. 
Okay, that sounds good. I would just want clarification on those issues because it did sound like it was a waiver and fee issue. Ms. Mumgard? I um, just wanted to note that the, on the web page, that um, the fee waiver is underneath meals. Yeah. And that could, I could see where that could be confusing, uh, mm. that, what that is for. But the fee waiver is because you apply for it for the free and reduced lunch is my assumption. Um, but I could see. In order to be eligible, unless you're in one of the comprehensive schools, you you have to apply for the free and reduced lunch because that's how it's documented that you're eligible for fee waiver. Right, but I, I was actually looking for it and it took me a while to find the fee waiver form and that is because it's under the meals. Makes perfect sense, but for clarity, it is on there underneath that. Okay. So. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, this will be back at our next meeting for action. That brings us to uh, tonight's action items. We'll start with 11.1. Uh, missing my numbers here. 11. Dot, and it also says 11.1 there. Well, we're going with the first one. 2022-23 evaluation of the superintendent of schools. Is there a motion? Mr. Boswell? I move approval of item 11.1. Is there a second? Ms. Ms. Byer? Uh, I second that. Any discussion on this item? Ms. Byer? Well, I just wanted to take a moment. I uh, was on a family vacation, so I could not go and be part of our last meeting. And I just wanted to reflect on Dr. Gaussman's first year with us. And <clears throat> I must say that I, I am very pleased with uh, Dr. Gaussman's outreach to our community and to our schools and our staff and the uh, excellent work that's been done on going and moving forward our strategic planning process and i look forward to another uh good year and um having a new strategic plan probably about this time next year so thank you for coming and leading our education community uh, for the pre-k through 12 in lincoln any other comments on this item seeing none laura would you please call the roll Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danning? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Mumgard? Yes. Dr. Rauner? Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Uh, with that vote, I can officially say, Dr. Gosman, uh, congratulations on an amazing first year. I would also like to take this moment uh, to make a uh, quick announcement. The last time that we made significant changes uh, to our appraisal instrument was when we welcomed Dr. Joel to the district. Now that Dr. Gosman has a year under his belt, uh, this seems like the perfect time to review our evaluation process with his input. Uh, and tonight I'm announcing the formation of an ad hoc committee to perform that task. The charge for this committee is to collaborate with Dr. Gosman and legal counsel to review and recommend any changes to our evaluation instrument, the timeline for evaluations, and our overall evaluation process. Ideally, this work should be completed before our summer goal setting retreat but I'll leave the specifics of the timing up to the committee chair and our next board president. I've asked Kathy Danick and Dr. Rahner to serve on this committee along with Lanny Boswell as committee chair. Thank you to the three of you for serving. Uh, next, that brings us to item 11.3.1, tuition charges. Is there a motion? Mr. Boswell? I move approval of item 11.3.1. Ms. Meyer? I second that. Any discussion on this item, Ms. Danik? And just want to reiterate, how many students do we charge tuition for in LPS? It's a small handful of students. And for the vast majority of them, when they look at these tuition rates, if they, they wanted to option in, they could option in and avoid that is tuition, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Other, Ms. Meyer? Could you explain when people have to go and pay tuition? I think that's a question that the public would have. There, there are very few individual families that would pay this tuition. It is sometimes the case that a school district outside of Lincoln wishes to send a student in their attendance area to us for specific services, and then the district pays the tuition. Okay. That helps clarify yeah, not that. the parent. Other questions on this item? Seeing none, Laura, would you please call the roll on item 11.3.1? Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Mrs. Duncan?
Mrs. Danik. Yes. Mrs. Duncan. Yes. Ms. Mumgard. <clears throat> yes. Dr. Rauner. Yes. Ms. Byer. Yes. Mr. Boswell. Yes. Mr. May. Yes. Next is uh, informational items. Do we have any reports from board committees? Seeing none, are there any reports from special appointments? Seeing none, that brings us to the superintendent's update. Dr. Gosman. Certainly, and thank you for the opportunity to give yet another update. Uh, this is the time of year, obviously, where uh, we're digging through a number of end-of-year celebrations. It's very exciting in any school district. Uh, I have to admit, this month might be the most overwhelming month I've had in my first year uh, here, it's simply because, uh, you know, as the number of events to make it to in any one evening uh, is significant and, uh, and yet awesome at the same time. I'm absolutely loving it. I'm not whining about that in case anyone's wondering. Uh, I just, um, of course, uh, look forward to doing all I can to help uh, our students and families celebrate the great things that have gone on for this school year and, of course, for their school tenure. And I look forward to my first season of LPS graduations at the end of this month where I will personally attend everyone's graduation. So that will be a bit of a weekend. Yeah. Um, I will say hello to my wife after that weekend's over. Uh, boards, uh, board members, year of service and thank yous. Another tradition here in Lincoln Public Schools is thanking our board leadership uh, for another year of service. And what our community may not realize is that our board members are full-time volunteers. I think Ollie Wally pointed that out, but uh, that, is, that is correct. They do not get paid for the countless hours they dedicate to learning about our school district from students, staff, and families. And if I could again put on the relatively new member of the team hat uh, and indicate for 20 some years I've been a superintendent of schools, I'm not sure I have ever seen a board that works as hard as this one does uh, behind the scenes uh, and uh, I admire that they work through complex issues by attending meetings boy they like their committee meetings uh, reviewing pages upon pages of information and listening to many stakeholders through conversations emails each with very differing and passionate opinions our board members do all of that while keeping the mission of serving each and every student almost 43,000 of them when making their decisions so I want to say thank you uh, board members uh, for all that you do. Recognizing Board President Don Mayhew, Board Vice President Connie Duncan, ESU President Bob Rahner, Dr. Bob Rahner, and ESU Vice President Lanny Boswell, we have a small token of gratitude, which is at your station, as an additional thanks for your leadership this past year, as we will be donating these books in your name to the following elementary schools. So President Mayhew, we are going to donate books to Hill Elementary School. Uh, Vice President Duncan, the books uh, before you will be given to the Zeman Elementary School students. Uh, ESU President Dr. Rahner, those books will be donated to Randolph Elementary School. And ESU Vice President Lanny Boswell, uh, your books uh, that are there in front of you will go to students at Clefcorn Elementary to receive those books in your name. And finally, Mrs. Duncan. <laughs> Tonight marks the end of your eight years serving on the Lincoln Board of Education. Have you ever noticed <laughs> that often in this world you hear about a force of nature before you witness the force of nature around your person? That's what happened to me about a year ago. I learned so much about this force of nature that is Connie Duncan. And I don't want to make it sound like Hurricane Connie, when, because you think of destruction, and that's you are anything but destruction. But I don't know how to phrase to somebody, like when I'm trying to explain to them who, like when I was hired, you were the board president. What's the board president like? Force of nature. That's, that's what should be on your name tag. What I witnessed immediately was undying advocacy for students. A wealth of knowledge of LPS. I think only maybe Ed Zimmer has you beat on that. All things Lincoln. In every corner of Lincoln, everyone knows the force of nature that is Connie Duncan. The way in which you sell the community. Uh, even with occasional blemishes here and there, it is one of the most fantastic places. And it's because of people like you. And again, I'm going to go back to right where I started, which is undying focus on the needs of students. As a former special education teacher, you understand the complexities of the classroom and the many challenges our staff and our students face. 
I really appreciate your passion and willingness to make the tough decisions to help carry us forward. While you will no longer be serving, on our communities, uh, serving our community's children through the Lincoln Board of Education, we know that our students can count on your continued advocacy through the many community organizations you continue to work with. And I have already talked to Todd. He's in the room somewhere. I saw him come in. You're, you're not permitted to change your cell phone number because <laughs> we want to know where we can get you. Thank you so much. Uh, for all you've done for embracing our students for wrapping your arms around them and providing them with support while they work to be the very best that our students can be and I, I would then turn it over to board president Mayhew at the end of my report here and any board colleagues who might have a word or two they might like to say my dear board colleagues as we're all aware this is Connie Duncan's last official board meeting if there was anything that you wanted to say to reflect on that this would be an appropriate time for that we'll start with Ms. Byer well Connie You've always been just a positive force. And I want to thank you for going and always putting our students first and our families first and, and your sensitivity to issues because you have taught in our schools. Mm -hmm. And that brings a whole new perspective to this board that I'm happy with who's coming to replace you, but I'm going to miss that teacher perspective best wishes in all your endeavors and I know you'll always be there for us thank you so much thank you, Barb. <laughs> mr. Boswell and of course Mike um, so I too would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your years of service both to Lincoln Public Schools and to the community I think of your generosity your hard work and your team spirit that have been an inspiration to all of us You've been a valued leader on our board, twice serving as our president, frequently chairing key committees, and always seeking consensus. You have a way of bringing us together. Prior to serving on the board, you were the co-chair of our 2014 bond campaign, and when it was time to propose another bond in 2020, you were part of our leadership team that year. Uh, many fond memories of that year and enjoyed working with you. Each time you demonstrated that work ethic and your ability to pull the community together. Your leadership and expertise have been instrumental in securing the necessary resources to support our students and staff. And beyond your service on our board, you're involved in so many community organizations and boards. Your generous spirit, tireless dedication has made Lincoln a better place to live, work, and to learn. And you've earned the respect and admiration of so many people in our community. And as Dr. Gosman said, even though you're leaving our board, we, we know that we will continue to work with you in your other capacities. So you have my deepest gratitude for your service to LPS and Lincoln. Thank you so much for making Lincoln an even better place to raise a family. Thank you. Mrs. Danik? So is this Duncan, oh the number boy. one job of <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a story's coming my way. <laughs> <laughs> number one job of a board member is always to reach out. We've always reached out. But we first met during the bond issue. And what we discovered is once a rocket, always a rocket. And she kind of joins the rest of us, so the rest of you may not ever get that. But those of us who are do. Uh, but the reality becomes you took your roots and you brought it into making the city a better place and this school district phenomenally better. As we did that first bond issue, and I remember going to some of the events that we had like three people, and then we go to one that had like 300. It didn't change your passion. That passion has come forward to when you held events and, and introduced us to people that talked of education all across this country. What you've taught me is I sometimes have to look past my own nose to see the end of my face. And more importantly, we all have something to give. And you give with every fiber of your being. But the best job in the world is, truthfully, being a parent and a grandparent, especially the grandparent part. So I know you will have ex extremely wonderful times with that young grandchild uh, from one grandma to another. You can't wait till they get to kindergarten and you can just tell the parents to stay away. So enjoy retirement. I know where you live. I will be finding you later with a little something. So, Other comments? Thank you for all you Dr. Honor? Well, 
I guess in addition to the other stuff, the other things I'm going to miss about you leaving is your positive attitude and your sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Things get tough, and having you in the meetings made them all much better. And so, I don't know, we're going to have to get Pius to have to work on that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Mrs. Mumgard? Um, Connie, you, you um, admitted to me last week or two weeks ago that while you were president, my arrival time always made you anxious and oh, nervous. I'm so I'd, I'd come in at 5.58 and I'm like, I never let you down, no, man. Never. Never. Um, also, it's my understanding that my predecessor, Ed, would write an ode oh. to those who were leaving. <laughs> and um, I, I can replace Ed. No, I can never replace Ed. I, I can do all things as Ed could do, but not as well. And I'm sure, pretty sure uh, doing the ode as well. But I gave a, a stab at writing an, an ode for you, uh, Connie. And so uh, it's called Constance's Ode. The first thing I figured out is I don't know how to write an ode, nor is your name Constance which many times I've been told. That's all right. I also did not know how to be on a board, nor did I know you, and yet that we served together eight years, I do thank the Lord. <clears throat> our first month together, we got our photos taken, went to a board training, and learned about school law. I learned that you have a wicked sense of humor, are so dang fun, and are also generous to a flaw. You are supremely skilled as a leader with a good listening ear. Your get her done attitude often comes with a, okay, are we done now here? <laughs> My tendency to process and process and process may have sent you up a wall, but when I needed you in Boston, in DC, in committees, and here in this room, not once did you hesitate or let me fall. I will miss your jackets, your laughter, your willingness to work hard for what you know is right. I will miss your empathy, your positivity, your parenting advice. Quite simply, I will miss your unique light. Our community is better because you answered the call to come work hard for its children and fight for all to really mean all. <coughs> As for me, I thank you for eight years of learning, giggling, sighing, superintendent hiring, on and on I could wend. I am thankful for simply getting to know you, Constance, my friend. Thank you. That was wonderful. Oh. My turn. <laughs> <laughs> As a long-serving member of this board, I've had the pleasure of working with many wonderful individuals over the years. But tonight I want to take a moment to recognize someone who has been a true friend, ally, and leader during her time on this board. Connie Duncan has been a constant source of inspiration and motivation for me. We have worked closely together on numerous committees and initiatives, and I can honestly say that I have learned so much from her. She has always been a passionate advocate for our students, teachers, and community, and her dedication to ensuring that every child in our district receives a high-quality education has been unwavering. Her insights, ideas, and collaborative spirit have been invaluable to this board, and I know that we will miss her greatly. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our colleague for her years of service and commitment to our district. We wish her all the best in her f future endeavors, and we know that whatever she does next, she will continue to make a positive impact on the world around her. Thank you, my friend, for all that you have done and for being such an incredible partner in this important work. We will miss you, but we know that your legacy will continue to inspire us for years to come. There is a present for you from staff and the board at your place, and the floor is yours. The floor is mine, and I almost made it through without a tear. Thanks, you guys. I'm going to make it through this as well. So, you know that I don't like to talk a lot. I'm always the worker bee, but I did prepare something tonight, and I think that you'll, you'll really enjoy this. So I've loved every minute on this board, from starting my day in a classroom with a school visit to spending an afternoon reading and reading to understand everything on an agenda. I always thought that LPS was a strong district, but it took me getting on this board and attending conferences with other school board members across the country to realize that so many districts look up to us and see us as the district that exceeds all expectations and has the strongest community support of any city in the U.S. We're so lucky to be at Lincoln Public Schools. But I don't want tonight to be about me, enough of this. 
So they say it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to be the support system of a school board member. All of us know that. My husband Todd, way back there, and my boys PK and Harrison, and their wives Katie and Brooke, have always been by my side. I will make it, hold on. <laughs> and willing to listen and rearrange family vacations and family celebrations, anything for LPS, they always said. So Todd has been my sounding board for eight years, the poor man. And sometimes I think he wants to push the mute button, and he has slightly done that to me a few times. But my in-laws, Robert and Karen, always willing to work around my board schedule and understanding if I can't make every event. My sister Susie and her husband Darren in the front row, watching board meetings and calling the next morning to chat or even laugh. Susie, of course, is a mother hen and during controversial times was known to demand that I do not walk alone. My brother Jim and his husband Patrick watching board meetings all the way from California and calling me to give their advice on issues. See, I've got a really good village that takes care of me. Thank you. But what I learned from all of you on this board the last eight years has made me grow as a person more than any of you will ever know. So you've become my friends. We laugh together. We disagree. But always at the end of the day, Kathy reminds us, what about the kids? And tells us a story. And we all start to come together. Those are the times when we're all together that I will miss the most. So tonight, I want to tell you what I've learned from each of you very briefly. Dawn, the one, one of the most caring people I know. You taught me to really think through problems and listen more. Thank you. Annie, you taught me how to listen with my heart and slow down on making decisions. I'm still working on it. Barb. You taught me that life is not always fair. And you need to speak up for those that need you the most. Thank you. Lanny, you taught me that data always tells just as good a story, and you are always there when I call ready to help with more data. Bob, you taught me to listen to the experts and use strong evidence to make my case. And Kathy, my fellow rocket, you taught me to always remember my roots, ironic you said that again, and where I came from when making difficult decisions. John Neal, I'm not leaving any of you out, the board member whisperer. <laughs> you taught me to think through things rationally and be prepared, and don't poke the bear of senators. Laura, <laughs> you taught me what dedication really means. You're always there for all of us. Sometimes I know us a lot. Mindy. The hardest working person I know. You taught me that there is always a story to tell, but there's only one correct story. And Kirk, sorry, I wish I had your brains, but I don't. <laughs> you taught me to really to understand technology, or better yet, as you said to me, just give it to me and let me take care of it. <laughs> and Van, you taught me to always think about what it would be like to walk in someone else's shoes. That's something I have to remind myself of daily. Liz is not here, smartest woman I know. She taught me how to calm down. We'd be in meetings and she'd look at me and she'd go like this. <laughs> Matt, oh Matt, sometimes our minds and mouths say the same things. Some things are not appropriate. You make me laugh. Because I'm almost always thinking the same thought you are. But you taught me that using a number and ending it with ish is a very smart move for me. <laughs> Jim, the forever wise one. You taught me to look at both sides and, of course, what the law really is. And Paul, it seems like years ago that I was working on this search and we spent a lot of time together, but it was less than a year ago. As I've said so many times at speaking engagements, I helped with all of you to get the district a fabulous superintendent, and now my work is done. Drop the mic. <laughs> so the last eight years have gone by way too fast. As many of you know, I'm a planner. Being on the school board was part of my life plan, but also giving someone else a chance to provide a new voice and perspective was also part of my plan. I'm leaving you in great hands, and I'll always be a phone call away. I'm not changing my cell phone, so you can call me. So if you are looking for me, you might find me with a beautiful little boy named Kanan out there with his mama. Kane and James Duncan, and soon another baby boy. So I'll be the one that they're all calling Granny. So stay tuned. Connie Duncan.
I assume that concludes reports? Superintendent Gosman. That brings us to announcements then of upcoming events for the board. On May 10th, we've got our uh, tomorrow, Face the Chamber at the Lincoln Country Club. May 11th is the Asian American Senior Celebration, uh, 5.30 p.m. at Don Clifton. May 15th, next Monday, is our board organizational meeting, 6 o'clock here at the Steve. May 16th and 17th, uh, strategic plan interviews with DMG, also here at the Steve. May 17th, home built by Lincoln Northeast Open House, 5 p.m. at 3401 North 51st Street. May 18th, we have the Yankee Hill graduation at 9 a.m. at Yankee Hill, uh, and the Independence Academy graduation at 6.30 p.m. at the Career Academy. That brings us to our next board meeting here on May 23rd. There is no request for closed session, and so this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> 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 <laughs>